This is Nasha Kasha, Ukrainian Almanac. 28 minutes of stories about Ukrainian life. I'm your reporter, Stefan Andrusiak. On today's program, we'll celebrate January 7th, which is widely known as Ukrainian Christmas. And we'll travel to Winnipeg to feature two of Canada's preeminent choirs, Husli and Koshitz. January 7th celebrates the birth of Jesus according to the Julian calendar. That calendar was established under Julius Caesar in 45 BC. And so it was until 1582 when Pope Gregory's calendar shifted Christmas to December 25th. It's the same feast, it just takes 13 days for those observing the original Julian calendar to catch up. There are benefits to waiting, of course. I recall as a child staying home from school. Twelve meatless dishes on Christmas Eve in honor of the Twelve Apostles. Most of all, I learned young that it's okay to be different, not part of the crowd, and, by extension, to also honor others who are different. Here's a Ukrainian Christmas carol I'd like you to hear. Its melody was composed by Montrealer Oksana Senkyu. I found it on a CD that was included in Oksana's book, Mestatstvo Ukrainsiu Kvebeku, The Art of Ukrainians in Quebec. The performers are Oksana Senkyu, Oksana Kotskovich, Father Volodymyr Kushnir, and the late Father Oleg Koretsky, who died in 2013. I believe the harmonies are all the more beautiful when you realize that Father Koretsky was from the Catholic Church, Father Kushnir from the Orthodox. The words are traditional, and it's about the very first Christmas. Oh, ye rode, pray, pray. 
Prosvita Institute stands at 777 Pritchard Avenue in Winnipeg. Now, Prosvita means enlightenment, and it was formed in 1868 in the western region of Ukraine. It lit the Ukrainian spirit by developing language, opening reading rooms, hosting meetings, and encouraging traditions. In 1916, Prosvita took root and flourished in Canada. Reading libraries, dance groups, and choirs sprouted. On this night, chairs in a basement hall are being rearranged. Prosvita is the venue for a board of directors meeting for Canada's Ukrainian men's chorus, Husli. My name is Christopher Sklopovich, and I am the chair of the board of directors of Husli Ukrainian Male Chorus in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So my story actually starts a little bit northwest of Winnipeg in a town called Dauphin. Growing up being a, a big part of the Ukrainian Festival, the Ukrainian Festival was a big part of my life. My father was on the board of directors for a number of years, the president for several. Growing up in that environment every summer, I was exposed to virtually every Ukrainian performing group that Canada and even North America and, and even the world had to offer. One of those was Who's the Ukrainian Male Chorus from Winnipeg. Who's the always stood out as the group that I would most like to be a part of. They embodied the biggest part of the spirit that I thought spoke to me about Ukrainian culture. What does that mean? The Ukrainian people are a very musical people. Music has always united us. Music has always carried our story for generations and centuries. And to be part of a group that continues that tradition, keeps the songs of the past alive, and to preserve an art form that otherwise may start dying out. Uh, was something that always very much appealed to me. Professionally, I work for Bell Canada. Interestingly, when you look at the professions of the membership of Who's the Ukrainian Male Chorus, it spans a very wide range, all the way from university students to retirees, doctors, dentists, teachers, virtually every profession one could think of, you'll find it represented in Who's the Second tenor. Did you have to audition to become a member of Husli? Absolutely. Uh, as much as we are a community choir, uh, the Husli name has developed to become something that is of a caliber where we want to ensure that the talent continues to grow. And to do that, you have to bring in talented individuals. What does Husli mean and how did it begin? The choir known as Husli Ukrainian Male Chorus originally began in 1969. was founded by a group of graduates of St. Vladimir's uh, College in Roblin, Manitoba. Uh, many of them were originally from Winnipeg, and so when they finished their high school uh, time in Roblin, they went back to Winnipeg, and they wanted to find a way to keep going with their Ukrainian culture. And we were actually formed as the St. Vladimir's College Alumni Choir. The members of the time reached back to uh, renowned conductor Dr. Pavel Matsenko, who was their music teacher at St. Vladimir's College. And he suggested husli, which is an ancient Ukrainian instrument, uh, very similar to a zither. He recommended that as the name of the group. It was formalized in 1970, 1971, and it's become an institution in Winnipeg ever since. <laughs>
our last album that we released in 2016 was our 10th recorded album. It was our second Christmas album. As well as in 2009, we released a full disc of the Divine Liturgy. Does the Canadian landscape enter into the character of the songs at all? Interestingly, in our last album, which is entitled Christmas Star in 2016, we only had one English song, but it was the Huron Carol, the one true Canadian Christmas carol. And we thought that that was very appropriate and, and a great opportunity for us to show our range and show our appreciation to the Canadian cultural community. Enjoy. My name is uh, Scott Chabluk. I'm from Oak Bank, Manitoba, and I'm going into five years now with Hoosley. Where is Oak Bank, Manitoba? Oak Bank is about 15, 20 minutes east of the city by Birds Hill Park, uh, Cooks Creek area, out that way. You were born in those parts? Yeah, I'm actually the fifth generation of my family to be in Oak Bank. Uh, we're heavily involved with the Immaculate Conception Church. My dad directed the choir there for 20 plus years. I've been doing it nearly 10 myself. So you're knowledgeable in music. I've got a very musical background, both in my family with country music, uh, growing up around the bonfire with the guitars singing, and also choral music. I sang barbershop for a, a number of years, and also, of course, Ukrainian choral music. Hoosley, how did you intersect? Uh, I had been enjoying listening to Hoosley my entire life. I, I had it on a huge pedestal because this was a, a phenomenal men's choir uh, and my cousin Billy has been a member for, for decades, one of the original type of members. And uh, I used to listen to him and both of his sons sing with it as well and have for quite some time. And I felt the time was right. I didn't grow up speaking Ukrainian, so I had to learn. I'm still learning. I'm learning the alphabet myself. I didn't come in knowing the alphabet. Uh, I'm learning how to read Ukrainian as we go. I memorize what we're singing. Uh, what it sounds like. So it's not phonetically on the page. You actually need to know how to read Cyrillic. Yeah, you have to, you have to be able to read Cyrillic to be able to, to get this done. The phonetic language, we call it Ukrainglish in, in, in Oak Bank, that will write, uh, like Dobrevechir will be written D-O-B-R-E-Y-V-E-C-H-I-R and so on. So at first that's what I was doing, was having it translated or translating it myself to learn how to do it. Now I would say I'm probably about 80% comfortable with, with the Cyrillic alphabet that I can, I can piece it together and come up with it pretty well. You said you had to hit the low notes. Are you a bass or a contrabass? Uh, no, I'm actually a first tenor. So it's hard to tell with my speaking voice right now, but yeah, I'm one of the first tenors. You know, a, a good choir needs good tenors. Yeah, there's a, and there's a really good mix here. There's a lot of really solid guys. Uh, the first tenor section is incredibly strong. Well, tell me the difference between a first and a second tenor. Uh, a first tenor usually has the melody uh, in most times and gets some little solo points every now and then, whereas the, other, the second tenors are going to fill out the harmony range. Uh, the baritones as well are, are kind of filling the chord up. And then, of course, the basses are the... The, the, the percussion almost of the group and the, and the foundation. Thank you so much. Nasha Kasha comes to you from Radio Western 94.9 FM on the campus of Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. We're heard on CHMR 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland, on CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, on Local 107.3 FM in St. John, New Brunswick, on CJAS Radio 93.5 FM in San Augustine, Quebec, on CJLO 1690 AM in Montreal, 
on CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston, on CFMU 93.3 FM in Hamilton, on CKMS 102.7 FM in Kitchener, Waterloo, on CJAM 99.1 FM in Windsor and Detroit, on CKLU 96.7 FM in Sudbury, on CILU 102.7 FM in Thunder Bay, on 101.5 UMFM in Winnipeg, on CJTR 91.3 FM in Regina, on CFMQ 98.1 FM in Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, on C- CFBX 92.5 FM in Kamloops, on CJSF 90.1 FM in Vancouver, and on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo, British Columbia. The Ukrainian National Federation Hall, it's called UNO in Ukrainian, sits in the heart of old Winnipeg, which is to say the heart of Ukrainian Winnipeg. Down two flights of stairs from the street entrance in a practice hall, a tall man is opening what I can only describe as a lockbox built around a stand-up piano. It will be at the heart of a Christmas concert rehearsal on this night. My name is Scott Armstrong, and I'm president of the Okushitz Choir. I uh, myself joined the choir in 1980, 13 years old. Started as a first tenor. Now I'm lead baritone. I've been the president of the choir for the last 10 years, at least. That being my second kick at the cat with leadership in the choir. I was very fortunate to have worked in the choir alongside Walter Klimke and uh, some of his contemporaries. I learned amazing things from those people. And I'm so thrilled to be able to pay it forward to the new people now. I feel like a giant bridge between the past of the choir and where the choir is going now. Talk about your younger days, your youth, and, and growing up in the, the bosom of the Ukrainian community in Winnipeg. I was one of those people who um, led a, a dual life with a name like Scott Armstrong. You hide very well within the, the, the regular community. But I strongly celebrated all my holidays, was very involved within my church, baptized Ukrainian Orthodox, attended church, been going to church for 51 years. I'm 51 years old. Build on top of that, then it's not just about church. There are other parts of our community. And um, that's when I was fortunate to, uh, in the 1970s, I saw my mother and my aunt singing with the Kloschitz Choir. And um, my aunt did an amazing solo with the Winnipeg Symphony. And at that moment, I just said, I'm joining. Also, very um, strong musical background, did um, pipe organ primarily always involved in music and those were my loves. Was there ever any doubt that you were good enough to join this choir? You know, um, no, because this is not one of those kind of choirs. This is a a choir that loves, people who love to sing Ukrainian. We are fortunate that we have some voices that are better and some that aren't, but it doesn't matter. Our choir is about community singing as much as some people may feel otherwise. I've never felt that intimidation. Having said that, I do know that others do. That's unfortunate. We're not about that. Tell me about Walter Klimke and his legacy. He was conductor for 45 years of the first 50. And why was he a great leader in in your way? Walter had a real passion. Um, Walter's love for the music, his his desire was something within him that none of us could um, duplicate. He led the choir through amazing times. They started as a youth choir. They developed into a regular adult choir. Walter was the one at the forefront of um, re-establishing relationships with Ukraine. Walter led the choir back to Ukraine for the first time. They went in 1978. It was a real tough experience uh, in the sense that it divided our community locally. We had uh, protests against the choir traveling at a time when Ukraine was under Soviet domination. That didn't stop Walter in the mission of music. There was absolutely no religious music allowed. Everything was censored. That trip and the splitting of the community and the feeling by some that you shouldn't be going at a time when Ukraine was an imprisoned nation, how was that resolved? I I think time helped resolve what was happening and and what the mission was and that the... uh, the world wasn't um, as evil a place and it was okay uh, to share music at a time when we couldn't share anything else. I was fortunate to travel back with them uh, to Ukraine. I believe it was 1983 was the next time they traveled. It was still a scary time. There was censorship as well. It didn't stop us. A couple of times we got away with doing things that we shouldn't have. 
By the time we went back in 90 and 93, the world had really changed. I drag us forward to 93 because in 93 when we attended, there was a young music student, Miroslava Patches, who had to attend, her, had to attend our concert as part of her training at the Veal State Music Academy there. It's now all these years later and isn't it amazing, she's now our conductor. So we met her when she was a student in Ukraine. When she left Ukraine, she had no idea that she would ever conduct music again. You know, it was her passion. She was an amazing conductor there. And to land in our lap, having seen us in her, you know, where, where we were performing in Ukraine, amazing. You know, there's either a God or lots of karma going on out there. coming here and talking to us is amazing and sharing because we're about sharing music um, our music is available on our website or on our YouTube channel you know you want our music come get us that's why we're here so thank you for helping us share spell Koshitz for me K-O-S-H-E-T-Z K-O-S-H-E-T-Z thank you very much Gosh. pleasure take care thank you Her name is Miroslava Pachis. Born in Ukraine, a musician by profession. She teaches piano, theory, and she conducts. She was born in a very small town called Dubove. Trained in Ushhorod, the regional capital in that part of Ukraine, and in Lviv. Her father, a priest. Five children, she's the oldest. Of her family, she is the only one who left Ukraine. In 1993, the Koshitz Choir visited her part of Ukraine. She, a student, was told it was mandatory to attend. She sat there and says she was amazed. So I say, sitting there, you probably said, I I can someday conduct this choir. Absolutely not, she says. First of all, she never really thought she would be a professional musician. It was her father who said she would study music. In that time... In that part of the world, you listened to your father, she says. Never regretted it. She came to Canada because an aunt invited her here for a visit, met a young Canadian, fell in love, and stayed. So she joined the Koshitz Choir. She says the choir was already outstanding when she joined it. If there's anything she has added to it over the years, it was to expand the number of choirs and the kind of repertoire. Not only classical music, there's a folk group, folk. 
folk. Tak. A chamber choir? Ukrainian music is so rich you can show it off in so many forms. Whether you understand music, know how to read it or not, we will find a place for you in one of our many choirs. Many who join our choir are not Ukrainian. Many Ukrainians don't know how to read Ukrainian. If they want to be a part of us, we, who are of Ukrainian heritage, need to protect our Ukrainian language and songs. In closing, she says, I am privileged to be in Canada, living here, and doing what I love. Nasha Kasha will be ending its six-year run this coming February. Once this veteran completes his 300th episode, he'll be going on to another project. Current, recent, and past episodes have been archived. Listen or re-listen as often as you like. They are free. Go to Nasha Kasha, one word, nashakasha.libsyn.com. These archives will remain in place throughout the summer of 2022. Partial funding for Nasha Kasha has been provided by the Shuchenko Foundation and by the Ukrainian Credit Union. I'm your reporter Stefan Andrusiak. Back in a week, God willing. Domeli zustrichi za tijdin chasu. Dorohi sluchachi.